Well, good afternoon, everyone, and what a, what a great pleasure it is to see so many friendly, familiar, welcoming faces. Welcome to Tanglewood 2017, and welcome to the first of our Talks and Walks series. Today's guest, I'm delighted to have with us, Jeanette Sorrell, who uh, also has a, a long and personal history with Tanglewood. Uh, she was here uh, two years ago, uh, directing a concert by her outstanding ensemble, Apollo's Fire. And I'm just wondering how many were actually at the concert last night. <laughs> yay, yay. Apollo's Fire is one of America's, one of the world's leading period instrument ensembles. It was founded 25 years ago, so this is a 25th anniversary appearance here at Tanglewood, and we're going to be talking with Jeanette about the work of the ensemble and last night's program and lots of other really interesting things, but you've got a longer history than, than that here with the festival, going back to your years as a Tanglewood Music Centre fellow, uh, studying conducting, which I'm sure everyone would love to hear a little bit about that and working with none other than Leonard Bernstein. So, Jeanette, welcome and great to have you here. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> I just have to say that you all were such a fun audience last night. Thank you so much. Um, you know, the great thing about live performance is that it's really a two-way street, right? And the response that we get from the audience completely affects the way we play on stage because it affects the way we feel. Um, so we kind of felt that it was a party scene last night, and um, it was, we had a great time, so thank you all. Um, yes, I had the great privilege of um, studying in the conducting class here at Tanglewood uh, in 1989, um, and uh, it was definitely a memorable summer. Um, it was, for me personally, a, a, a challenging summer because um, I already knew very well when I came here that I wanted to be an early music specialist. I wanted to work with period instruments. I actually knew that since I was 17. I know that sounds so nerdy. Um, <laughs> so, but I really wanted to be an early music conductor who had some conducting technique and some rehearsal technique. And in those days, there were a lot of harpsichordists leading Baroque groups who really didn't have any conducting training or not much. I wanted to try to do it as well as I possibly could. So I was on this trajectory of studying, conducting at a high level, even though I knew perfectly well that I was not going to become a symphonic conductor. Um, so I had the summer here. Um, I was the baby of the conducting class. I was also the only girl in the class. Um, Maron Alsop was a fellow. That she was the conducting fellow that year. So she was always off with Bernstein. She never came to our class. I never met Maron the whole summer. <laughs> I was like, you know, the little runt of the <laughs> conducting class. Um, but um, the, the teachers were very kind to me, actually. Um, Leonard Slatkin. Um, obviously, Leonard Bernstein, um, Gustav Meyer, probably. Gustav Meyer, yes. and Roger Norrington, who spent quite a bit of time here that summer. Yeah, so um, I uh, worked on Mozart with Bernstein. I felt like that would be a good meeting point for us. Um, and, you know, but one of the things that was so amazing about being around him that summer was um, we had such an international conducting class, as I'm sure is still the case today, and the students were from not only, you know, the UK, France, France, Germany, Italy, all of those places you might expect, but also from Russia and China and Japan and Israel and Eastern Europe. And Bernstein would give us our lessons in front of the whole class. That's how it was done. And he conducted each person's lesson in their native language. With the exception of the Chinese student. Um, and he greeted the Chinese student at the beginning of the lesson in Chinese. Sounded good to me. 
And, and then he said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to continue your lesson because I'm just learning Chinese. <laughs> this was when he was 69, I think, or it was oh, this is, uh, he would have older. been 71. Yes, just, thank you. Right, 88 yeah. was his 70th birthday, yeah. yeah. So that was inspiring and it sent me uh, to Europe the following summers to go work on my Italian and French at least. So did you admit to Mr. Bernstein that your interest was in the period instrument? And, and when we're talking about period instruments, we, does everyone have an idea of what this... Since the 1950s, really, there's been a, a movement developing... Uh, there, there was a movement developed where performers were more consciously going back and learning about the performing techniques of instruments and of repertoire as they would have been done roughly in the time. So uh, reconstructions of instruments as we, as far as we know them started to, to take place. Uh, the whole approach to the technique of playing changed, modified. So this became known as the early, movement, early music movement and period instruments. So orchestras made up of either original instruments from the time or replicas started to become commonplace. And for a long time, there was a great divide between what some refer to as the vegetarians, the ones who Which play... Which I am, by the way. <laughs> the one who play in the early music style and on early music, and then the full red meat guys on the other <laughs> side. And for a long time, near the two met. But over the years, there's been an incredible sort of cross-pollination. But... 1889, you sort of would have been the turning point there. So yeah. I was curious yeah. whether did you fess up to Mr. Bernstein that this is what you were interested in and what was his reaction? I, I, th I think I did or I think perhaps Gustav Meyer had told him because everyone in the class knew. I mean, they just knew. Um, and uh, so I, I think that Bernstein knew. I don't remember whether I told him personally or Gustav Meyer was the main teacher of our course overall. Um, but he was very kind to me and, um, you know, I think he liked... It. We were conducting with pianos. That's what you do in, in the conducting class here. And um, I think he liked what I was doing. Um, and... Uh, you know, what, what all those mainstream conducting teachers used to say to me in those days was that I was musical and therefore I had a right to exist. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. I'm sure some of you assembled here over the years got to meet Leonard Bernstein, whose centennial, centennial of whose birth next summer we will be celebrating in grand mm -hmm. style here at Tanglewood. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting him only twice and for a very brief time and just in those 30 seconds he would make you feel like you were the most interesting and most important person in the world. It was an incredible gift. So I can imagine, I can only imagine what it must have been like to be, you know, a, a student and subject to his pedagogical instruction and, you know, a young lady uh, interested in all you know, that must have really, really got his imagination going. <laughs> well, I, I do remember at the end of my last lesson with him, um, he gave me one of his famous big bear hugs, and it was, you know, I mean, I think all of us felt that way. Like, it was just like a wonderful kind of um, uplifting sense that, okay, here's this great man who we all admire who likes what I'm doing, you know. Um, so it was very sweet. Yeah. Douglas. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was only a few summers later then that you founded Apollo's Fire in Cleveland, and maybe yeah. can you talk a little three bit years, about how that later. came about? And sure, that's kind of an interesting story, actually. Um, it was three years later. Um, so well, after Tanglewood, um, I went and studied in Amsterdam for a year. Uh, Amsterdam was kind of the mecca for period instrument performance at that time. Um, and actually, to mention an interesting anecdote about Tanglewood, um, at the end of that summer, I actually found myself with a choice because Roger Norrington, who I, whom, 
with whom I spent quite a bit of time that summer, um, offered me the opportunity to come to London and work with him as kind of his apprentice. Um, it would have been an unpaid position, but I could have you know, hung out in all the rehearsals and been the keeper of his metronome. Uh, <laughs> Because he was very into, you know, exactly following the metronome markings of Beethoven and the symphonies, um, and so I could have done that, or I could have done what I had already made plans to do, which was to go and study harpsichord with Gustav Leonhardt in Amsterdam. Leonhardt was the great father figure patriarch of the entire early music movement, and the great harpsichordist of modern times, and. Um, it was kind of a tough decision because I sort of knew that going to work with Norrington would probably be better for my career. Um, but I felt that working with Leonhardt would be better for me as a musician. Um, and so I, I went to Amsterdam and worked with Leonhardt, which I loved and had no regrets at all. But I was, you know, holed up in my attic apartment for a whole year practicing 17th century music of Louis Couperin and harpsichord variations by William Byrd, who's you know, a Renaissance virginalist composer. Um, so pretty far away from conducting Beethoven. Um, but anyway, I came back, I ran out of money, um, and I was 26, and I was living just on prize money from a competition, which I knew was gonna run out. Um, and out of the blue, I was called by um, a countryman of Tony, Roger Wright. No, no. I'm afraid. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Tony is much superior. He's Australian. Okay. <laughs> okay. Roger Wright is a Brit. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Roger Wright is a, a prominent British uh, arts management person who. Um, later went on to run Deutsche Grammophon, Deutsche Grammophon Records and, and the BBC and various things. But at the time, he was uh, the artistic administrator of the Cleveland Orchestra. And he called me out of the blue. I was house-sitting for a former professor in Oberlin because I had no money. And um, he said, uh, we've been doing the search for an assistant conductor. Uh, we have this list of the 15 up-and-coming young conductors uh, which was given to us by Exxon Artists, which was a, a program that existed at the time for placing assistant conductors with the major orchestras. And he said, you're on this list. Did you know, know that? I said, no, I had no idea. And he said, well, the other 14 people on the list applied and already auditioned, and Maestro von Doknani did not like any of them. And, but you didn't apply, and I wondered why, and um, would you want to come and audition or interview? And, and, you know, I was not pursuing a symphonic career, but on the other hand, I had no job and no prospects. <laughs> and I was sitting in Oberlin, which is less than an hour from Cleveland. Um, so... You thought, what the heck? What the heck, <laughs> right. <laughs> So all of my symphonic scores were packed up in boxes. They had been packed up for the whole year that I was in Amsterdam. I hadn't looked at them. So I'm frantically ripping them out of the boxes and reviewing, you know, Brahms' third symphony, first movement, when does the second oboe come in? Because I thought that I might be asked that kind of thing um, because I forgot to mention that uh, Roger apologized that they would have to interview me with Doknani first before there could be an audition because all of the orchestra's time that was available for an audition had already been used up by the 14 candidates. <laughs> Who, it turns out, all of those were young men, which I didn't know at the time. So, so I went to Severance Hall intending to interview. And um, when I got there, Roger said, I uh, just got a phone call from Maestro von Doknani. He wants us to come to his house. So I went with Roger in his car to Dokunani's house. This was in August, and we found him out back by the side of the pool. And so we all sat down at a lovely little table by the pool, and we chatted about politics in Germany for 20 minutes. <laughs> and Dokunani's family members are quite high up in the political echelon in Germany. And um, he asked me nothing about music. 
nothing whatsoever. And then after about 20 minutes, he said, well, my dear, I'm really sorry, but I don't think there's any point in trying to find time with the orchestra for you to audition because the audience in Cleveland would never accept a woman as a conductor. And I couldn't believe that he was actually telling me that that was the reason I could not have an audition. Um, you know, I mean, it was like, please sue me, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but I wasn't interested in suing anyone, and I just blurted out the truth. I said, well, sir, that's fine, because I didn't apply for this job, and actually I really want to work mostly with period instruments. Um, and that was the end of this interview, as you can imagine. Um, but Roger Wright took me back to Severance Hall where my car was, and he said, I'm so sorry about this. I had no idea he felt this way. I think it's ridiculous. Um, but I've always wanted to see a Baroque orchestra happen in Cleveland, and I think you're the person to do it. And if you like, I will help you. And it was amazing, because I had never met him before that day. Um, but he was a man of his word, and he took me down to the largest foundation funder in Cleveland three times. The first two times, they said no. And the third time, they said, all right, here's $25,000, now leave us alone. <laughs> and the, the best little ending to the story is that um, about four or five months later, Roger left Cleveland because he went to become executive producer of Deutsche Grammophon Records in Germany. And so I was left holding the bag with $25,000, which is not enough to start a period instrument orchestra. And I was 26 years old, still house sitting, sitting in Oberlin, and I didn't know anyone in Cleveland, and I had never lived in Cleveland, which is where we were launching this orchestra. So it was pretty wild. <laughs> That's fascinating. Do, do you, wh when you set out to start this orchestra, as Tony mentioned, there had been something of a tradition of uh, performing on period instruments in this country, in France, England, uh, Amsterdam, as you mentioned. Um, were you thinking about continuing that tradition, bringing it to Cleveland, or in some way breaking from it? Was there something that you were reacting to, or were you trying to throw yourself, your hat in the ring with all of these other groups? That's a great question. Um, some of both. Um, during my time in Europe, what I really loved was getting to go to early music concerts that were in artistic spaces, you know, like a medieval sacred concert that's held in a medieval church um, with candles, or, you know, um, uh, a, a 17th century Baroque opera that's held in a former palace, which was where it was premiered, that kind of thing. I mean, the setting makes so much difference. So I did want to try to bring that mentality, at least, back to Cleveland, although, of course, we don't have many medieval churches in Cleveland. <laughs> um, but as much as possible, I tried, and I still try, to marry the program to the venue. Um, so that was one part. But I, I did have a kind of specific agenda that was different from the other period groups. Um, because based on all of my reading and study, it was so consistent what people wrote about music in the 17th and 18th centuries in all of the, what you'd call instruction manuals for musicians, or we call them treatises. They always said the same thing, which was that the role of the performer is to move the emotions of the listeners. And the word affect or affections, uh, music is supposed to move the affections, the emotional moods. Um, and Baroque composers were very conscious and very specific about how they did this uh, using rhetoric, which is to say that um, they were consciously imitating the techniques of the ancient classical Greek and Roman orators who would manipulate the moods of their audience uh, through their pacing, through the rise and fall of their voice. Um, if you think about a modern day example might be um, a great speaker like Martin Luther King Jr., right? So just with the rise and fall of the voice, he could build up excitement and leave you in suspense and bring you down to contemplation. That's rhetoric, and that's what Baroque music is about. Um, but I felt that the period instrument groups were not really 
doing that. So. so, so how tell us about the the group's name, Apollo's Fire. Um, so Apollo was the Greek god uh, of music, right? And he also carried the sun across the sky in the golden chariot. Um, there was a great interest in Apollo, well, in all the Greek gods during Baroque times. And many Baroque cantatas were written about Apollo because he was the god of music. I did not choose the name. Um, the founding board of Apollo's Fire chose the name. Uh, basically, it was about two months before we were due to make our debut concert. And we didn't have a name yet. And I said to them, we've got to lock ourselves in a room and just not come out until we've named the group, because we have to send out a press release. <laughs> and so we locked ourselves in the room. But at some point, I left to go get a cup of tea, because I'm always drinking hot drinks. And um, when I came back, they said, we've named the group. <laughs> and they were looking at me. They were so happy and excited. And um, I said, OK. And they said, it's going to be Apollo's fire. And I said, ew. And I thought it sounded like a rock group. So I was worried that people would think we're a rock group. Um, but I think the name has kind of served us well, actually. People remember it. Sure, they sure do. <laughs> 